Since Albert Einstein published his theory of general relativity in 1915, scientists have been on a 100-year mission to prove him wrong or right. And today, they've taken one step closer to confirming that the genius had been right all along by capturing the first ever photograph of a black hole. It was captured by a global network of telescopes called the Event Horizon Telescope. This black hole is 55 million light years from Earth and has a mass six and a half billion times that of the sun. And its round shape proves that Einstein's theory that has formed the basis of our understanding of the universe is true. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now from Atlanta, Georgia by Laura Seward Forsyth. She's the founder of the space analysis and consulting firm Astrolytica. Laura, are you excited? I'm very excited. This is a great moment for humanity. We've mm. never before seen a black hole. And so this is a very exciting time for all of us who have been studying astrophysics mm -hmm. really for, for centuries. Right. This is a, a pivotal moment. Right. So, I mean, I guess it's kind of paradoxical that you can't quite have a proper image of a black hole because a black hole per se is something from which even light can't escape, right? So we're, what we're looking at is a black hole from a distance and the stuff that surrounds it. What are we seeing when we see this photograph? What we see is the material that is surrounding the black hole called an accretion disk, hmm. and it is falling into the event horizon. So the telescope is called the Event Horizon Telescope. It doesn't directly image a black hole per se, because that's impossible as far as we know. Mm -hmm. It images the event horizon, that point, that boundary where light can no longer escape. And mm -hmm. so it is imaging that boundary of a black hole. And we're seeing the silhouette of the black hole with all the material that is falling into the black hole surrounding it and glowing. Mm -hmm. And tell me why this is an absolute confirmation of all the math and the theory that came before it. Right, so even Einstein wasn't sure that black holes existed. He thought it was maybe a byproduct of the mathematics that we use for um, modeling our universe. And so it took us over 100 years now to actually directly image a black hole. Previously, we had only indirectly imaged it. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we see finally using radio interferometry, the image of this black hole silhouette. And see, so we are actually viewing directly a black hole, um, at, at least the, the point where the light Mm. can come to us, that point, that boundary that we can actually view it. That is what we are seeing. And so this is the very first time we've ever been able to see this. And so this is actual direct evidence that these phenomena exist. We've got one in the center of our own galaxy. Mm -hmm. The one that we view today, that one is much larger mm -hmm. um, than the one that's in our galaxy. It is, it is um, M87 is what we call right. it, and it is huge. And so it's just amazing that we can vi visualize something that is so far away. Right. Um, and bring it to our, our telescopes, bring it to our eyes, per se. And, and the fact that it's much bigger, is that the reason why we decided to focus on that and not the one that's at the center of our galaxy, which, if I remember correctly, is only 100,000 light years away. This is 55 million, right? So is it because it's bigger, it's, it's more capable of being seen? Right. So this uh, telescope has gathered over two years a huge amount of data. And it, it looked at both this one uh, image of this black hole, this M87. It mm -hmm. also looked at Sagittarius A star, which is the one in, in the center of our galaxy. And this is the first one that we've been able to directly see because it is so much larger, because it is so much more powerful. Um, and they're still looking at the images mm -hmm. of Sagittarius A star in the hopes that they will be able to have another image like the one that we see today. Yeah, and one of the things a lot of people didn't get when they watched Interstellar, right, was when they visualized a, a black hole, it was, it was a sphere, right? And I think, I guess because in two dimensions, we were always used to this idea of our, our sort of, of space being a kind of pool and a black hole would be like a drain that sort of sucks things down, right? Just explain to me why it's this spherical thing from which energy, matter, and light can be sucked in from all directions. Right. If you're imagining a black hole just based on a textbook, that's two dimensional. Mm. You have to think about the universe as three dimensional. This is, in a sense, a sphere. A, a singularity is, is an actual point, And the event horizon is the sphere around that point. 
And we don't understand the math and the physics in that singularity. And so the only thing that we can really understand is what's happening at the event horizon and beyond. And so what you're seeing right now on the screen are these mm -hmm. jets coming out of M, right. or, or at least a, a black hole that is like M87, mm -hmm. which is another thing that we're trying to understand. It's not just the event horizon and the sphere. It's also the accretion disk, and it's the jets that come out of it, these powerful um, e e eruptions of energy and material that come out of these black holes. And we're still trying to understand the physical mechanisms and, and all the information that we can get from the evidence that we gather from these telescopes. Right. Is this giving us any, any indication, even though we're only looking at what's cooking on the sides before it sort of goes in, right? Does this in any way still give us even the smallest fraction of an idea closer to what's actually happening inside? What happens to matter? What happens to light once it goes inside a black hole? Yeah, we certainly hope so. So we want to understand what is a black hole, what is going on inside there, inside the event horizon. And in order to do that, we look at the very boundaries. And uh, Stephen Hawking, for example, had some theories about some material that could possibly escape. And we've never directly seen that. So maybe finding more evidence for, for those kinds of particles or finding other evidence for things we hadn't even thought of before. And this is why we use these telescopes to explore the universe is we want to understand the world around us. We want to understand the physical mechanisms that cause these black holes to happen so that we better understand the world in which we live in. Mm -hmm. And we want to understand also what we see when we look at the gravitational lensing effects, for example. We understand that gravity bends light and we can use that to our advantage and we have used that to our advantage to see farther into the universe than we could otherwise. And so understanding how we can use these things to our benefit um, is also very helpful in being able to understand what else is out there. And what do you think the likes of Einstein or Stephen Hawking or Carl Sagan would have thought of what we just saw today? Oh, they would have loved it. So one of the things about being a scientist is you have to use the information that you have in front of you. But if you could travel 100 years, hundreds of years, thousands of years in the future, then you, you're going to want to ask some questions of the scientists in the future. What do you see? What are the tools available to you? What data do you have available to you? So I think any scientist from the past, whether it's you know um, Carl Sagan or Stephen Hawking or um, Einstein himself, would have been thrilled at this discovery. Laura Seward Forsyth. Always a pleasure having you on the Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.